Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and in today's video the original plan was that we would build a big ship in low Kerbin orbit then take said ship to the surface of Eve and Gilly to not only showcase the uh, a ship design that can carry two Kerbals to the surface of uh, Eve and Gilly but also take a rover with us and just generally do it in a nice cool style. However I edited this video together and it was well over an hour long which I think to be honest this is too much for a Kerbal Space Program video, so I took the decision to split it into two parts. This week's episode will be focusing on the build itself and the assembly of the multi-launch ship in low Kerbin orbit, and next week will be the EVE mission itself. I thought that was kind of the best way of splitting this episode up, really. I did think about a few different ways I could get this all into one episode, but it would have meant speeding up the build process quite significantly. And I get a lot of good feedback from people saying that they really like seeing how these things are built because this is a very complicated ship. Lots and lots of different stages, lots of kind of unconventional use of parts. There's a robotic arm on it. Uh, there's one there as well that I'm placing on the side of the rover now. And, and obviously it consists of two components, like two launches. And I, so I really kind of wanted to be able to showcase the build, but if I sped it up any faster than what you're watching now, which is four times faster, it generally becomes way too difficult to follow what's going on. I've already taken a lot of liberties in cutting stuff out, like all of the staging organization has been removed from this build for the most part. So this is kind of what's left. So I hope it's an acceptable compromise to have the, the video split into two parts, I'm just warning you right at the beginning, I hate when channels don't disclose the fact that a video is two parts until the very end of the first half and then you're also greeted to like, oh, by the way, you're going to have to wait a week now for the rest of it. So I'm putting it at the beginning, like I normally try and do, to uh, let you know that if you want to just click off now and save this video into your watch later playlist uh, and wait until the second part's out, you're free to do so. Anyway, now that's all out of the way, I have already kind of summarized <laughs> what this mission is going to be just then, so I'm not going to go over it again. What I just did was I built the rover, now we're going to build the rocket itself. So I'm using a service bay there just to make sure that our landing legs will definitely keep the service bay off the ground and make sure it doesn't absorb the impact of this rocket landing on EVE. You may have noticed, so that's why the service bay isn't actually attached via a decoupler or anything, it's just there to help me as a guide, I'm going to add the rover that I just built as a sub-assembly later on. You may have noticed uh, this thing has two seat capacity, has a two seat capacity for two Kerbals because the rover has two seats, so it would be a shame to not be able to use those two seats. I feel like I said the words two seats quite a lot in that sentence just then. I experimented with a few different setups for a more perhaps elegant solution than what I ended up going with. The first idea I had was to use the Making History cockpit, which is the Gemini style cockpit, which is probably the most aerodynamic uh, two seat command pod, at least for the top of a rocket. But it's quite heavy and it's a, it's a really awkward diameter piece because it's part of the Making History piece size. and. I could really get a nice looking rocket. It was all a bit janky because it wasn't the right diameter for the decoupler below it and there aren't really any good upper stage engines that I like necessarily from the Making History pack that fit with that diameter. So in the end it was like, do I go with the 2.5 meter diameter pieces or the 1.25 meter pieces? In the end I went with 1 meter pieces. So then that came me to like, okay, what kind of capsule to kind of use? Because the Mark 1 capsule only has space for one Kerbal. So I thought maybe a Mark 1 capsule and then the Mark 1 lander can, but the lander can's a bit fat, it's not very aerodynamic, and it's not very heat resistant either, which is not a good thing for EVE. The other thing I considered was the two-seat crew module that's designed for like, I don't know, Mark 1 space planes. You're the one that doesn't actually have any control points, it's just a capsule. So I would have needed to add a nose cone, uh, an SAS unit, and a probe core as well, and... By that point, it just added too much mass. I thought this was the best solution to have two Mark 1 cockpits, one on top of the other, and to kind of keep the aerodynamic profile looking nice and, you know, sensible looking, I encased the lower one in a fairing. So this is the new Laon Aerospace Mark 1 sized two-seater cockpit. If you would like to use it in your own builds, I demand royalty in the form of either a t-shirt purchase or a uh, donation to my Patreon. Uh, you have been warned, my lawyers will be in touch if I see anyone using this configuration without my blessing, thank you very much. Now, as you can see, we have all of our ladders equipped. I kind of felt like most of the build here spoke for itself, so I didn't go through much specifics. If you want lots and lots of detail about the more specific nuances to building an EVE rocket, I would highly recommend checking out my EVE tutorial video that I did for Loud Aerospace not that long ago. Uh, this is what I ended up with. You can see I maybe throughout this build, you saw me placing fuel tanks and then randomly a bit later removing them and replacing them with something else. That's because what I have edited out is I would build the rocket, 
hyper-edit it to the surface of EVE and then try and take off if I ran out of fuel and couldn't get into orbit. I'd go back to the vehicle assembly building, modify it a little bit and then go back and try again. So in the end I started out with just a central vector with six surrounding fuel tanks that fed into it in an asparagus setup. By asparagus setup I mean they don't all feed into the centre and then detach at once, they detach two at a time so that we're always keeping the maximum amount of fuel on this ship and minimizing our dry mass. It's the most efficient method of building a rocket. It's just never been done in the real world because it's very, very complicated. But the Kerbals, they know their stuff. It's not a problem for them, so I felt happy <laughs> implementing, it into this, implementing it into this rocket's design. Uh, but, like I said, I initially went with just six fuel tanks around the one vector. I guess because we've got that additional mass of having a second cockpit on board, Takeoff was a bit tricky. It probably would have worked if we'd been launched from the top of a mountain, but I kind of wanted this thing to work from relatively low areas. I can definitely confirm that this rocket works from 800 meters above sea level on EVE. It could probably do a little bit more than that, but I don't know the exact cutoff, so there's the disclaimer. Like I said, I then ha I added two aero spikes on the first set of fuel tanks that would get deployed just to help kick us off the ground and get that initial boost of speed up to get us through the thickest parts of Eve's atmosphere, Eve's atmosphere, which is obviously the most challenging portion of the ascent. All of that's done. I added a heat shield to the top and bottom of the craft. The bottom one is obviously there to uh, deflect the heat, but that would have made the whole thing very, very wobbly. Imagine, you know, you've got a broom and you're trying to balance it on the palm of your hand vertically. That's the kind of thing that would happen to a ship entering Eve with just the fuel tank on the bottom. It would almost certainly tip over. So what I did was I added the top heat shield there just to keep this thing symmetrical. The top shoot will add as a kind the top um, heat shield I should say will add as a sort of drogue shoot and help keep this thing aerodynamically balanced again and prevent it from flipping over upon re-entry to Eve. And it's very successful. I do it on all my Eve landers pretty much, and it works very very well. I added that kind of girder structure there just to kind of make it look visually sensible. But you could just use the offset tool and not bother with that. But I like my quirky ship designs. Now came. To the actual design of the transfer stage to EVE, the bulk of which will be in the second rocket that we launch. So you're not going to see me construct it here. So this is the construction of the first rocket now, which is the bigger of the two. We have the EVE lander and ascender unit at the top, as well as some liquid fuel tanks that will serve as the transfer stage from getting to low Kerbin orbit to low EVE orbit. All of the rest, like the actual command unit itself, which will have a capacity for six Kerbals, and we'll also have the EVE lander unit, uh, the Gilly lander built into it, I should say, uh, that will all be in the next rocket that we design, which is coming up momentarily. I'm just adding some control units here to this lower stage here, because we're going to be using this Rhino stage to get this thing into a full circular orbit and I don't want to leave that tank left stuck in low carbon orbit once the mission is done. I want to be able to de-orbit it afterwards. And I thought we may as well put some parachutes on it just so we can save it. Save the polar bears, recycle, etc, etc. Now we're going to build, like I said, the transfer stage as well as the command unit itself and this is going to serve as the Gilly lander. For those that don't know, Gilly is pathetically easy to land on like it's very it's it, it's almost like docking with something landing on gilly you basically have to kill off all your speed to zero relative to gilly surface before you touch the surface otherwise you'll just bounce and send yourself off into an orbit in, in fact it's so ridiculous you have to be really careful when using a, a, jet, a jet pack on a kerbal an eva pack i should say to be more accurate when doing surface excursion activity on the surface of Gilly, because you could well end up <laughs> accidentally putting your Kerbal on a, on a Gilly escape trajectory just by being a bit too liberal with your EVA pack burn. So doesn't take very much to land on Gilly, so you can pretty much do it with anything, hence why I'm just going to be doing it with the actual command unit itself. And we have all of our liquid fuel tanks below it that will be there to kind of act as kind of a transfer back to Kerbin and also just to help supplement the uh, liquid fuel we added on the first rocket, which you can actually see me, you can actually see it there. I did add, I did end up adding way too much liquid fuel than what we really needed. I mean, I, I, uh, this, the liquid fuel below us, I added an excessive amount because what I was planning on doing was when it came to getting back from Eve and returning to Kerbin, I wanted to do it like speed run, like I wanted to do the fastest method possible rather than necessarily the most realistic or efficient method possible, which would have meant a very expensive burn and we'd be entering Kerbin at a very obscure kind of oblique angle and we could have just used the heat shield on the command unit to slow ourselves down because heat shields in this game are very, very powerful. What I didn't realise is that the heat shield doesn't actually protect that hitchhiker storage module very well. The hitchhiker storage module kept exploding due to the heating. 
So I couldn't end up doing a really inefficient burn to get back to Kerbin in the fastest method possible. We have to do a sensible transfer back to Kerbin, which meant actually doing a rather efficient set of burns. So it was a very excessive amount of Delta V in that lower stage. But that's one reason why we have perhaps too much liquid fuel. The other reason was because I knew this mission was going to be very, very long-winded. I'm very tight for time right now. I really wanted to just make sure I definitely had enough. I'd rather have all that excess fuel and not end up needing it than not having that excess fuel and needing it. Here you can see us in the tracking station waiting for an EVE transfer window, which is when EVE is about 55 degrees behind Kerbin. You draw a line from Kerbin to the sun and to EVE. The angle that forms at the sun should be about 55 degrees. In this case, I just eyeballed it, but you're more than welcome to use an actual proper tool like transfer window planner or Kerbal alarm clock or something like that if you want to be really, really accurate, but I find eyeballing often works just as well. But here we are, well into our launch. You can see I made one modification to this rocket that was omitted from the build footage, purely because I, I obviously forgot to include it in the build footage. But I added that little solid rocket booster to the side of this thing, just to add a little bit of extra thrust to get us kicked off the launch pad, because our thrust to weight ratio in this first stage is not great. That solid rocket booster probably didn't do a lot of meaningful contribution, all things considered, but it looks quite cool. I always liked the novel look of a of the asymmetrical SRB setups that a lot of real life rockets use. Uh, the reason why the rocket wasn't horrendously thrown off course is because the relative thrust of that Thumper SRB is pretty low compared to the five Mastodon engines on this rocket. And as you can see when we're doing our gravity turn here, you can see these engines have quite a lot of gimbal. So the gimbal of these engines can easily overcome the asymmetrical thrust of the uh, side mounted SRB. We are punching through the cloud layer, which uh, is unfortunately still a little bit glitchy. My mods haven't fully been updated to uh, the new version of Kerbal Space Program just yet, so that's going to be something that will get fixed soon, hopefully. Obviously, we can't rush the mod makers. It'll be done when it's done. Uh, there's not much I can do until it is done, but I think it looks serviceable nonetheless. Now we're just going to complete our gravity turn, and then we can get ready to perform our second launch. I don't know why I'm already starting to talk about the second launch, because we are nowhere near it just yet. We're launching using the in the, the stock uh, apoapsis and periapsis indicators just there. It's the maneuver node maker tab, but I'm not using the maneuver node capabilities of it. I'm just looking at our apoapsis and periapsis height and the time to apoapsis as well to perform our circularization and, I guess, uh, to launch burn to uh, get into orbit without needing to use the map screen. So that's how I'm doing this if you are curious. But I guess we've got the map screen open now because we're getting to a relatively high apoapsis. I wanted it to be at least 80 kilometers, ideally slightly higher, because I wanted to do our transfer burn from Kerbin to Eve in one go. I didn't want to do multiple burns at Kerbin periapsis because I didn't want this video to go on too long. At the time of recording, I didn't realize it would end up being too long anyway, and I'd be splitting it up into two videos regardless. But I still think it's nice to try and minimize the amount of burn time, especially because we have the Delta V. Uh, this isn't an SSDO mission or any mission that requires hyper-efficiency, so I wasn't too worried about doing things necessarily as efficiently as possible. So I thought, let's just be a little bit more inefficient and do a, a long, long burn at periapsis. Because we're doing a really long burn at periapsis, it means that our periapsis height would be dropping quite a bit. I wanted to ensure that we wouldn't be dipping below the atmospheric border, which is about which is 70 kilometers in Kerbal Space Program. So I wanted to make sure we were definitely clear of it by being that little bit extra bit above that point. <laughs> Trailed off in terms of quality that sentence, but I hope it made sense nonetheless. Here we are, launching the second rocket. Very uh, SLS-inspired looking there, and now we can recolor those 3.75 meter diameter parts. It looks even more SLS-like, especially with those two SRBs on the side as well. And those are not uh, new 1.8 SRBs, they are the old kind, but they're still pretty good for this purpose. And in fact, you know, the Mammoth engine there is powering this stage, and the Mammoth is based on the SLS engine concept, which is, of course, four space shuttle engines in one cluster. So there you go. I've, I've done an accidental SLS. This is now an SLS replica video. Uh, there it is. I actually really like the aesthetics of this rocket. In fact, both rockets look pretty good. One of the downsides of many of my EVE rockets, especially in Expedition EVE, is that the rockets themselves look very, very unsightly and unrealistic looking. I like to think I've, I've improved in terms of my overall rocket aesthetic when it comes to making uh, EVE launches. If I were to lo have launched this entire thing in one go, which I definitely could have done, it may be sort of making a Saturn V heavy <laughs> rocket, like a Falcon Heavy style rocket, but with Saturn V parts. Uh, it would have meant that the fairing would have been excessively tall, the payload would have been very wobbly and susceptible to crack attacks. 
I, I decided to just do two launches like this. And it means that the rockets themselves on the launch, they do look fairly realistically proportioned. So now we're coming up to the uh, latter stage in this video, and that is, of course, docking the two craft together. So I had a look to see what our relative target position would be when we got to our apoapsis, and we could see that it was slightly... Uh, behind us, so I put my apoapsis uh, slightly higher than our targets to make sure that it had enough time to catch up to us because uh, the higher you are, the slower you are, so then if your target is behind you, you want to enter a slightly higher orbit. There goes the fairing, uh, not very SLS-like, I forgot to enable clamshell displays, we did the Kerbal fairing deploy method which is just to explode into 10,000 mini pieces, but I don't know, got to add a little Kerbal element to this video somehow, and then we can circularize, and I'm not going to be uh, deorbiting this Rhino stage because it doesn't have the ability to deorbit itself once we're in an orbit around Kerbin, so I'm going to make sure I detach it. Well, I've done it now, but I made sure I detached it just before our periapsis lifted above the atmospheric line so that our Rhino stage would naturally deorbit itself. It wouldn't need to be, you know, pushed out of orbit or, you know, self-propel itself. So there we are. We're in uh, orbit. Both stages are in orbit. Now we need to, to uh, you know, bring them together. So I just created a maneuver node and I managed to get a zero kilometer separation from the map screen at this point. You might not be quite so lucky later on when we're actually docking the ships together above EVE, so next next video, uh, we won't get quite so lucky with the uh, encounter nodes. In fact, they're going to be way off because I launched at completely the wrong time on EVE to get an appropriate uh, encounter with our target. For a reason, I wanted to launch the EVE rocket on the daylight side of the planet just so you could see what was going on. And uh, to get an appropriate orbit, I would have had to have launched on the nighttime side. So, like I said, like, like I said earlier, we had X, we have excess delta V in the command pod unit. So, we had the fuel to dock the ships together. Don't worry, next the next video will have a happy ending, I promise. But uh, as so will this video. We have now got the ships nice and close together. We can just use the uh, command pod stage to dock the two together because once we detach that Rhino stage, which we will need to in order to expose the docking port on that uh, top ship, we won't have any means of power in the top ship. Even though we have Jebediah there boarding the command pod, all he can really do is SAS control on it because the engines, first of all, we don't want to use the engines on this thing because we need all of the Delta V in those upper stage engines for our EVE ascent. And those are the only engines we have. We have some very small engines on those robot arms, uh, which I've done. Were they even in the time lapse? I've just, it's just occurred to me. I didn't, they were in the time lapse. I think they were initially, but then you can see I've added them to those uh, cubic octagonal like structs on some robot arms. Like they, they unfold their hinges. Just they, uh, the reason I've put them like that is just because when I initially, they, what they are, those are deorbiting engines for Eve. We don't actually end up needing them, which is probably why I completely forgot that I didn't include them in the time lapse. But in their original configuration, which was directly attached to those upper fuel tanks, they provided zero thrust because they burned straight onto the top of the fuel tanks below us. And in KSP, that means they provide zero thrust. Like literally our orbit speed did not change by a single meter per second after completing like burning up all of their Delta V. So I had to put them on those girder pieces just to kind of get them clear of the ship. So they'd be burning into kind of empty space, which I guess is the criteria for engines providing thrust in Kerbal Space Program. Oof, that was a very roundabout way of explaining things. But there is a beautiful shot of our ship. You might have seen uh, some great passing shots as Jebediah jetpacked his way back to the command pod itself. Ooh, there's, an, there's the lower stage on that cinematic zoom in that we're doing just here. Did I show the... I don't think I showed the Rhino deorbiting, actually, did I? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the deorbiting of the Rhino in just a second. Okay, guys, I just uh, paused the commentary there to try and find the footage of me deorbiting the Rhino. And then I realized I never actually did it. I left it in low carbon orbit for the entire duration of this mission. So I'm now, I've literally just done this, like, I've just finished doing it. I'm showing you the footage of me deorbiting the Rhino stage uh, now. So, so uh, you know, not the cleanest deorbit. I lost a couple of batteries, but the expensive stuff survived, which is what counts. Did a sort of soft touchdown. I wanted to aim for a water biome just so we wouldn't, you know, lose anything when it flipped over due to, I don't know, <laughs> gravity imbalance and whatever. But that's it there, all done. Here we are back in orbit. I'm gonna just deploy the robot deorbit arms just to show you what they are. There they are, those engines there. So you can see how that cluster has to try and extend beyond the stack of the EVA sender. That's that's what I was on about. Anyway, on screen there are links to more videos. The one on the left I'll update to be next week's video when it lands, otherwise it's just, I don't know, some random thing. The one on the right can just be a video that YouTube recommended to you based on its uh, learning algorithms, I guess. Twitter, Discord, Instagram page, and all that good stuff is in the description, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.